important topic. I was surprised to see on our RSVPs that there was about a 50-50 split of those of you who attended our first session in May and those of you who are here for the first time tonight. So I just encourage you to take this all in, continue to share what you learned this evening with your colleagues and your friends, those that you care for. Um, as I mentioned, I'm here on behalf of Cornerstone Family Healthcare. We're just one partner in this collaborative effort to raise awareness and programming around mental health. It is really just such an important topic right now in our community, as so many of you know, and we can see that from the turnout here tonight. We're working in collaboration with Access Supports for Living, Mount St. Mary's College, who's hosting us this evening, and Montefiore St. Luke's Cornwall Hospital. And all of that is supported by the Kaplan Family Foundation. So I'd like to just ask you to give a quick round of applause for all of those who have worked in getting us here this evening. Thank you. I'd like to make one other quick observation as someone who gets to manage the RSVP list for an event like this. Um, we have an incredible turnout of students here this evening. So if you look around to your left, your right, in front of you, behind you, we're here from all different parts of our careers, but I wanna just take this opportunity to ask our students to raise their hands so that we can see you. Thank you for being here. I hope that you know in a room like this, you have mentors and people that you can ask questions of and look towards as you are continuing and looking for guidance um, in your future. So with that, again, I just wanted to thank you all for being here. I'm gonna get to the good part of why we're here this evening and ask Dr. Force uh, to continue our introductions. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Dr. Larry Force, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Kaplan Family Foundation and Father Greg Pruitt, who is our interim president of Mount St. Mary College. We'd like to welcome you to the college. Now I have comments that I'm going to get to, but about five minutes before I arrived at this podium, Joan Kaplan gave me a note. So I'd like to read this note. Joan says, special thanks with love to Lauren, Debbie, Wendy, and of course, Susan. So can we please have acknowledgement for those people? Okay, so thank you, Joan. We'd also like to you know, acknowledge the dedicated work of Lauren Nauru. I know that David Jolly's here, who's the CEO of Cornerstone, but he needs to know publicly and privately that you have been unbelievable to work with and to make this happen. So again, thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge my friend and colleague, Dr. Jeff Kahana, who is the uh, history professor and also works with me on, on our Center on Aging and Disability Policy. Continuing the acknowledgments, Deb Meisner, and without her efforts, we'd be sitting in a dark room in an empty hallway. So we, we'd like to thank her. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Ms. Kathy Barton and Dr. Amanda Maynard and Mr. Tony Spano, because all of them have had their fingerprints on this. In addition, we'd also like to recognize, as Lauren indicated, the leadership of our co-sponsors, David Jolly from Cornerstone, Margaret Allers, Chief Nursing Officer from Montefiore St. Luke's, and Ron Calavito, the CEO of Access. One of the things that we wanted to say at the very beginning, it's a sense of heightened awareness, disclaimer. We're going to be talking about a sensitive topic. For those of my students that are in the psychology of death and dying class that I teach, I share with them that uh, some individuals have had too much exposure to death and some individuals have had no exposure to death. We want you to know that this is a safe place here and beyond here. So if there are certain topics or themes that are talked about tonight and you feel as though you just need a cup of coffee, go and get a cup of coffee. There are certain topics here that you want to talk about later, know that we're available. 
and Dr. Ken Doka has indicated his willingness to be present even beyond this evening. As far as an overview of Dr. Ken Doka, you can see from the slide that he's the Senior Vice President of the Hospice Foundation and he's Professor Emeritus of the College of New Rochelle. I could ask you to carve out the next 45 minutes so I could go over his bio, but he asked me to truncate it. He is a Professor Emeritus of the College of New Rochelle and the Senior Vice President of Hospice Foundation. He's one of the authors of the Dying and Death Life and Living textbook that I use in my class. So if there's students here for my online class, Dr. Doka is one of your co-authors. He is a prolific author. His books include End of Life, Ethics in a Changing World, Shattered, Trauma, Trauma and Loss, Living with Grief Since COVID-19, When We Die, Extraordinary Experiences of Life's End, Intimacy and Sexuality During Illness and Loss, Coping with Loss, Dying and Death, Finding Your Pathway Through Loss, and I could go on. I kid you not, I have probably about 30 more references of books that Dr. Doka has been involved in. In addition to, to these books, he's published over 100 articles and book chapters. Dr. Doka is the editor of both Omega, the Journal of Death and Dying and Journeys, a newsletter to help in bereavement. He has an ongoing blog for Psychology Today entitled Good Morning. Dr. Doka was elected president of the Association of Death Education and Counseling in 1993. In 1995, he was elected to the board of directors of the International Work Group on Dying, Death, and Bereavement and served at its, as its chair. It goes on and on and on. He's the recipient of the Caring Hands Award as well as the Dr. Robert Fulton Founders Award. In 2006, Dr. Doka was grandfathered in as a mental health counselor under New York State's first licensure of counselors. He's keynote conferences throughout North America, as well as Europe, Asia, Australia, and New Zealand. He participates in the annual Hospice Foundation of America teleconference and has appeared on CNN and Nightline. In addition, he served as a consultant to medical, nursing, funeral service, and hospice organizations as well as businesses and education and social service agencies. He's, Dr. Doka is an ordained Lutheran minister. But as important for me, he's a friend. Uh, Dr. Doka uh, hired me um, for my first adjunct position at Concordia College when I was 23 years old. Now at the age of 24, I've known him for a year. Um, <laughs> but we've stayed as friends for a lifetime. So with that, it is an honor to introduce Dr. Ken Doka. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Got to give you one little, uh, I, I really like what Larry said about the sensitivity, uh, that we're dealing with topics that are sensitive and I, one of the promises that I make to you tonight is that I will be one of the last people to leave the building tonight. So if anybody wants to have a, a, a conversation, I'm more than happy to do so. Um, except there's one proviso tonight that I hate to make, but I, and I never usually do that, uh, but I have a bad cold, so I'm not gonna shake hands or hug, which is hard for me, because I'm a hugger. <laughs> um, and then second of all, I wanna thank Joan and Lauren uh, the Kaplan Foundation, Cornerstone, and of course Mount St. Mary for having me here. I, I so much enjoy these presentations and I'm so impressed by the, all the college does around it and all the Kaplan and Cornerstone does around it. So, um, so thank you uh, again and join me in thanking everybody who's responsible for this event. Now before I begin tonight, there's one secret that I'm going to share with you. I have found out that tomorrow is Larry Force's birthday. <laughs> so, with the hope that it'll deeply embarrass him, <laughs> let's sing happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Larry Force. Happy birthday to you. I bet you didn't see that coming, Larry. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, what I want to do tonight is talk about complicated deaths and complicated griefs. Um, and again, I just want to make a few points in the introduction. Uh, people die as a result of traumatic injury, sudden death daily, but not all traumatic deaths. Uh, are, victims die quickly. Some may linger for a while. And not all sudden deaths are caused by violence. And then when dying does occur as a result of traumatic or sudden death, the grief process may be more difficult or delayed. And I want to spend a little time studying that tonight. Uh, but again, the expertise of us as bereavement professionals and others, even good friends and family, can make a difference in how individuals and, and communities cope. So my goals tonight are to talk about trauma and grief and to differentiate them, uh, to indicate factors that complicate grief and deaths that are due to overdose suicide, to talk about what we call trauma-related care, um, to define complicated grief, and then to list five ways that complicated grief is now listed in the DSM-5 TR and briefly, briefly describe a, a treatment modality. So just to kind of give you an overview of what this field is. And so obviously we're going to go fast. Um, one of the things that's interesting about trauma, I always like to say trauma is grief plus. Um, and what I mean by that is we're dealing, in a traumatic event, we're dealing with a sense of loss, but we're dealing with more than a sense of loss. What, tra what makes trauma trauma is that it, we also experience not just a loss of some, some important piece of property, maybe in a car crash or, uh, or, or a death, but we're also experiencing the loss of what we call an assumptive world. And an assumptive world is that we make assumptions. Um, that, that are just part of our everyday life. That life is predictable, safe, the world is benevolent. So for instance, my plan tonight is after I finish here, uh, I'm gonna get in my car, I'm gonna drive across the river to Poughkeepsie, and uh, maybe after watching a sitcom for a half hour just to relax me, uh, I'm gonna end up going to bed tonight. And then something happens, and all of a sudden the world seems less predictable, less safe, less benevolent. And so it creates an enduring sense of anxiety and mistrust. And I think it's interesting as, as to how we, over time, begin to try to work with this. And one of the articles that Jack Gordon and I wrote, we talked about resonating trauma. Now, we, we are of all different ages here, um, but how many of you remember the Columbine massacre? School shooting. Okay. You know, I've always found you have to be really careful in giving references like that, especially when I was teaching graduate school, because I'd say, how many remember the Beatles song, and I'd name a song, and half the class would look at me confused, and the other half would know it. But here's the point. Um, if you remember, and you see this in all kinds of instances, one of the things that happened is after Columbine, there became tremendous rumors that there was going to be a massacre in a mall on, on Halloween. Any of you remember those rumors? And, uh, and of course, nothing happened. But Gordon, Jack Gordon and I began to look at that and say, what happens is that the world becomes so unpredictable that we want to create something, and when nothing happens on October 31st, we can go back and say, we're fine. And so I, I often call that resonating trauma. And again, I'm not going to read this all to you, but I'll leave it up for a minute. Um, trauma really has an impact on us. And we're just beginning now to understand the biology of grief and the neuropsychology of grief, uh, which I'm not really getting into. But again, um, what we really are realizing now is that exposure to complex trauma in early childhood really affects us. It really affects the, the brain chemistry and the, and the operation of the brain. Uh, that has lifelong implications. So what factors actually affect response? Well, one is the degree of expectedness. Do we really expect this to happen? And again, that can be um, a very individual notion. A number of years ago, I counseled a woman whose 25-year-old uh, whose son died of a drug overdose. And 
when I asked her, I, when I said something to the effect it must have been a shock, uh, her response was interesting. Her response was, no, I always knew once he, when he was 16, nine years ago, and once he started using drugs heavily, that one day there was going to be a policeman at my door. My only fear was that it might have been in a car accident, in a car crash, where somebody else may have died along with him. So, you know, in other words, this wasn't unexpected news, even the sudden death of a 25-year-old son. Another issue is preventability. Can we see this as being preventable? And that's a continuum. Some traumatic instances we see as being totally preventable. Others we question. Um, and then, was it the result of something, an, in, an intentional act to harm, like a homicide, or was it simply just one of those random events that occur? So these are some things we have to look at when we're looking and trying to understand the impact of trauma. Well, whenever there is a sudden loss, there are some things that we're going to experience. And I want to just briefly look at what's common to every sudden loss and then what's unique to different sudden losses. One is, we, of course, the loss of, of the assumptive world. And then second is that people are experiencing both grief and trauma, two separate things. Now, there are people who will tell you, you treat the trauma first and then you treat the grief. My notion is you treat whatever presents itself. So don't get caught up in a protocol. The issue of preventability, the issue of powerlessness, the, a missing or disfigured body. And it often creates intense reactions, including anger, rage, anxiety, and sometimes survivor guilt. Um, you know, very often, for example, in 9-11, uh, people had a lot of survivor guilt after that because they kind of wondered, you know, why, was, why did this happen? Uh, I was 10 minutes late, and by the time I got there, uh, if I had gotten in on time that day, I would have been killed. The fact that I missed my train saved me. You know, that issue of survivor guilt. One of the things, for those of you who are in hospice, is we actually experience sudden loss in chronic illness. One of my longtime colleagues and good friends is a woman by the name of Therese Rondo, who's done a lot of work on complicated grief. And I always love what Terry says. Terry says, when she's speaking to an audience, she says, most people today die suddenly. Now, you're probably thinking, that's really not the case. Most people die of diseases. They spend some time in hospice. They spend some time in palliative care. Comparatively, few deaths are uh, without any warning. But then she adds, most people die suddenly in the midst of chronic illness. You never expect the death when it's going to happen. My father was in hospice care at the end of his life. Uh, and he had survived Thanksgiving and he had stabilized. And we just kind of had a feeling he was going to be around through Christmas. In fact, he died the Sunday after Thanksgiving. You know, so we don't always expect it when we expect it. So, um, I'm sorry. So, you know, uh, again, one of the most interesting questions to ask is, was the death expected when it occurred? And I had done some early research on that, which really was interesting. It was, it was probably one of my first articles that I ever published, but it was, it was a research piece. And it was just one of those fortuitous questions you ask that turned out to be one of the most important questions in the whole thing. Uh, and it was a, what I call a transition question. The study was on adjustment to planning and participation in funerals and grief adjustment. So we're going over the course of the illness, and then we'd ask a question just to transition. Did you expect the death when it occurred? Then we get into the funeral. But I didn't think that question was particularly significant. It was just a way of moving us along. What was interesting, one of the most interesting findings we had from that study is there was no relationship between the nature of the death and the expectation of death. So people would say to us in, in our study, yeah, he died of pancreatic cancer, uh, he was down to 80 pounds, uh, he couldn't move his arm. Did you expect death when it occurred? No. Uh, you know, it's amazing how much hope we can have. And so, yes, even in hospice, there can be perceived sudden loss. 
but of course, each other kind of sudden death issue has unique factors. Um, the issue of culpability, is somebody to blame? The legal after effects in an adversarial legal system. You know, um, one of the things, uh, a number of years ago when I first moved up here, uh, actually it was at the time of my father's death, I had just visited him in the hospital uh, before he came home to, to, for hospice care, I got involved in a small accident. Um, and it was, you know, it was my fault. It was a snowy evening and I didn't stop and I ended up uh, grazing somebody who injured their leg. You know, no big deal, never went to trial, settled out of court. But at one point I mentioned as we were going into the deposition that I'd like to say, you know, I'd like to apologize to the person. My lawyer said, never admit fault. You know, so I, I couldn't even do that, which I really wanted to do. I have to move out of the camera, I think. Um, homicide is a rough one. First of all, it's stigmatized in disenfranchised deaths. We're sort of ashamed to tell somebody that or somebody we know was killed. Um, here's an interesting fact. About 80% of homicides are committed by people we know. Only 20% are, are stranger homicides. Isn't that a comforting thought to go home to tonight? When you think about that, that you're much likely to be killed by a family member or a friend than an absolute stranger. If I continue talking about this in about five minutes, whenever your partner or child picks up a knife, you'll be very cautious. Um, but think about what that does. It really creates a situation. I don't know how I get on camera, so I've got to stay on this side. Um, it creates a situation where survivors are likely to know both the perpetrator and the victim. One of the most difficult cases I ever had um, was an abusive father. And he was, uh, he was abusing uh, his wife. And their 14-year-old son picked up a kitchen knife and said, Dad, stop it. And the father, who hadn't been that aggressive with the children, um, got outraged by this, this kid picking up this knife and, and threatening him. And he literally stood before the kid, hitting him, hitting him on the head, and saying, you're so brave now, huh? You think you're big now. Uh, and he literally opened his shirt and said, go ahead, go ahead. Um, and eventually got the kid so upset as he kept hitting his head and, and hitting his cheek that the kid actually plunged a knife into him. Think of the grief of that situation. For the father, I mean, not for the father, uh, he's beyond grief, but for the, for the son, for the siblings, for the mother. Horrible, horrible situations. And that's not uncommon in homicide. I haven't figured out this camera yet. <laughs> what? Oh, you're doing it, okay. Um, and even if the survivor was not a witness, they still have intrusive imagery. Um, you know, they imagine what the event was like. And of course, the media gets involved. And of course, the criminal justice system gets involved. And sometimes they may settle, you know, they may settle, uh, take a plea agreement, where maybe the person who killed somebody that you loved and cared about is getting 10 years in prison. And you're saying, I'm never gonna see this person again. And we use another term too here called secondary victimization. And what that means is that individual victims of homicide often feel victimized again by the media, which may denigrate the reputation of the deceased, or the criminal justice system, which may fail to capture the perpetrators, fail in persecution, or in the court case, besmirch the person's reputation. So again, a lot of issues here, a lot of dangers. And again, what we see clinically is this. Um, family members are at risk for, for developing sustained and dysfunctional reactions. And there are almost 3,000 homicides annually in the United States, including car crashes caused by reckless driving and, and DUI, which are included in that figure. 
and approximately between 120,000, every one of those people who die, there may be uh, four to, uh, to eight people who are affected by that loss and, and will grieve that loss. And again, survivors face challenges to their emotional, mental, and social health. Their well-being remains a major mental health uh, uh, issue that we have to deal with. Suicide, too, creates its own special issues. Again, often suicide arises when there's lots of conflict and ambivalence. There's stigma and disenfranchisement. We don't want to let people know that somebody committed suicide. There's an interesting study. <coughs> There's an interesting study that was done a number of years ago. Uh, and it, it was kind of an experimental study. But a bunch of college students, you know, because they're, uh, you understand as college students, for psychology professors, you're the closest thing we have to uh, experimental mice and rats, right? So lots of research is done on, on college students. Um, but in any case, in this particular study, um, what they ended up doing was they ended up giving students three different scenarios. And in one, uh, actually four different scenarios. So, so it starts out, a person parks a car on a hill. And in some cases, the, the brake fails and the car rolls down a little bit, stops at a curb or maybe just gently bumps another car with no damage. In the second scenario, um, it causes some damage. In the third scenario, it actually goes down quite, quite a bit and, and, uh, and hits somebody who's driving a car, causing some degree of, of injury. And in the fourth scenario, the car travels down and hits a little boy on a bicycle and kills him. And in each of these, they ask the question, same scenario, you know, just this car failing with a brake, same scenario, but they ask the question, how much fault was the driver? Anybody want to guess what happened? The more serious the consequences, the more people ascribed hurt that the driver was careless. So in other words, People said, oh, well, cars roll sometimes, you know, when it's only going to be a bump or a, a hitting the curb and stopping. But the more, the more serious the consequences were, the more people blamed the driver. So that happens in suicide, too, because we don't like to think that if somebody, uh, somebody commits, commits suicide, that can happen in our family. So we tend to look at this and say, they must have done something wrong. They, they were obviously dysfunctional. Something, something wasn't right there. Uh, and again, the family feeling stigma and feeling guilt and preventability. Should we have known it? Should we have known something? And of course, you know, the spiritual issues. Um, some churches don't bury uh, or, or will not bury somebody on consecrated grounds. And again, the suicide rate is underestimated, especially in children, adolescents, and the elderly. Uh, and, and there's probably a difference. We're going to talk about this in a minute between understanding suicide attempts and suicide deaths. Um, and then, you know, and then comparing it to just risky and self-destructive behavior. The person who drinks two six-packs of beer and then goes out and drives, uh, we don't consider that a suicide, but it's clearly a self-destructive act, right? So, when you understand suicide behaviors, you have to understand that there are, are three things. One is uh, suicide ideation which is relatively common, that, you know, that sometimes in their life people may say, you know, I've thought about it, never seriously, but I thought about it. In some cases you may find what we call our suicidal gestures. These are a little bit more serious. When I was an adolescent, um, we, were, uh, we, we lived by, um, uh, by the East River. Uh, by the Hellgate Bridge in Astoria. You all familiar with the East River? You all familiar with the Hellgate Bridge? Uh, one of the da most dangerous currents in the world because you have two tidal currents intermixing, creating all kinds of whirlpools uh, from the sound and the, and the harbor. So it's getting, you know, two different tidal things. It's, it's actually not a river. Anyway, when I was about 15, 
one of the girls in our, uh, in our crowd, who we consider a little bit of a drama queen, had broke up with her boyfriend, and she decided that, that she was going to commit suicide by walking into the river and being swept by the currents. And I look back on it now, and, and I think two things. is One, you know, she maybe went to her, her ankles, past her ankles in water, and kind of looked back on everyone saying, is nobody going to stop me? And, of course, we stopped her. The other thing I thought about that, uh, as I look back now in retrospect, is none of us ever said anything to anybody else. You know, that conspiracy of silence that so often envelops adolescence. We never talked about it. We never said anything. So again, um, you know, we, we see that. Um, attempts are, are more serious, but seem to be a very different act in when they're attempted and, and who attempts them in terms of their characteristics. And then, of course, people who die by suicide. So we see, you know, we see four, you know, four different kinds of behaviors. With adolescents, uh, CDC did a very extensive study in 2009, um, and they did a study of 15, uh, 150,000 adolescents, one of the biggest studies done, and found that 26% had feelings of depression and emptiness, 10%, almost 11%, had actually made a suicide plan, and close to 7% had actually attempted it. So if you're working with adolescents, this is something you have to consider. Uh, and again, we have all kinds of reasons for it, biochemical changes in adolescents, um, you know, particularly those who are on antidepressants, substance abuse, social and psychological stresses of puberty, the organization of middle school. It's funny, there have been studies that have said, you know, people go to middle school at different years. When I was going to school, it was seventh through ninth was middle school. Some places it's four through eight, some places it's five through eight. Doesn't matter. As soon as a kid enters middle school, the suicide rate goes up. So if you have a place where it's seven to nine, you, that's where you'll find the jump in suicide rate. If it's four to six, or, uh, or you know, starting at fifth grade, that's where you'll find the jump. Okay, uh, and then social and cultural changes. And again, we find suicide in adult life, precipitating factors, the accumulation of negative life events, alcohol, uh, substance abuse, affective disorders, and they often occur in times when these factors rapidly accelerate. Now, one of the most underrelated uh, and underreported suicides is in later life. Uh, and, and while it's a problem throughout the life cycle, it really becomes more significant in later life because, uh, number one, suicide is still stigmatized. Um, older people don't write notes, they don't make threats, they just do it. So there's not, often not warnings. Um, medical examiners and coroners don't like to put down suicide unless they know beyond a doubt that it is a suicide because it has all kinds of insurance implications potentially and all kinds of social implications for the family. So unless somebody has written a letter, written a note, or expressed their wishes, which older people rarely do, they won't look at it as a suicide. And, and again, there's the thin line between assisted suicide and suicide in the course of a life-threatening illness. And so the cause may be difficult to determine. Did they overdose, you know, or did they just miss or mix medication? You know, what was really going on here? So what do we know? Well, the suicide height rate in elderly people is higher than in other age groups. Um, there are a higher ratio of deaths to attempts. Older people use more lethal means less likely to signal their, in, uh, their intentions. So unlike what you've heard in adolescence, it's not a call for help. It's a determination to end life. And again, a much higher ratio of male to females, maybe four or five to one. Well, another place that we see grief is in addiction, uh, and, which is a very complicating group, group of loss. A, a book just came out, which I highly recommend to people, called Devastating Deaths, um, which is about addiction. And it combines the complicating factors of suicide and homicide. Um, and, and you know, grief and addiction is an area that we, I know some of you are really into the study of addiction, and this is an area that we really need a, a significant amount of research on. 
Um, addiction is a complicating factor who, for someone who has experienced a loss. Um, and grief is an aspect of recovery. Um, as the recovering addict copes with the loss of triggers. You know, the first thing you have to learn when you, uh, when you go into recovery is that there are people, places, and, and things that trigger your use of drugs, whether it's alcohol or some other substance. So as you're getting, as you're getting, as you're trying to recover, you have to, uh, you have to deal with loss of these things. I once talked about the disenfranchised grief of the families of recovering alcoholics. And, um, and one of the things I think that, that was really int interesting uh, as, as I work with them is um, <clears throat> is that I, I work with one mother after I, I, I did a presentation who came up to me, a presentation like this, and she said to me, you know, my husband is a recovery al recovering alcoholic, and he has been for 10 years. He said the first thing he learned when he went into recovery was to avoid the people, places, and things that triggered his substance abuse. And then she said to me, I miss those people, places, and things. She says, I never want to go back to his alcoholism, and I want to be supportive. But we used to spend Friday nights and Saturday nights at a bar. We were involved in a darts club. We went to other bars with, you know, with, with our group, and, and we had all these activities um, that were around the bar that we now don't do. Now we, we go on New Year's Eve. She said, we used, to, we used to love the bar. We used to have a big New Year's Eve party, which we loved to go to. Everybody brought stuff. It was closed to the regulars. You know, only the regulars could come in that night. And she said, um, now we go to the, the basement of a church for an alcohol-free uh, New Year's. She missed it. We can grieve those things. Uh, and, and, of course, um, addiction can be a response to loss. We can have what we call masked grief, in which addiction is the, the, um, the presenting problem, but under that is grief. Somebody's using drugs as a way to cope with loss that they haven't found another way to cope with. Well, what are some of the theories about later life suicide? Uh, one is what we call anime theory. This is Durkheim. How many of you remember Durkheim? My sociology students here? No sociology students here. Okay, uh, Emil Durkheim was a French sociologist, and he did a very extensive suicide study. I got to tell you a personal incident about Durkheim. Um, I don't have it with me tonight because this was the last thing on it, so I didn't bring it. But normally, I uh, normally what I'm known for, even my students would know about it, was that each day I'd make up a list of things to do on a little index card. I'd color code it as to the time it was done. Uh, and that would be my agenda for the day, sort of. And, and I do this, and, and uh, when I was in graduate school, my, my roommate was a psychology, psychology student, and he got a big kick one day because he looked at my book, looked at my list, and he said on it was called Finish Suicide. I meant I wanted to finish the book on suicide by Durkheim. So he said to me, he said, I didn't really worry when I read that because you had things listed after. <laughs> He said, but I thought, if you were to do it, it'd have to be on the list. He said, the only problem I couldn't figure out is, how would you cross it off? So, um, but Durkheim believed that the suicide rate increases as groups become less integrated with the larger society. And so, you know, so one of the reasons for the older, uh, older person's suicide is again, you know, retirement and other factors may marginalize older persons. And then another theory is what we call cascading losses. That as people age, they have cumulative losses, uh, cascading on one another. Um, they have sensory deficits, which may impair their enjoyment of life. They become more isolated and more alone, and that taxes their ability to cope. And again, um, it's like the straw that broke the camel's back. That one more loss just kind of ends it. And then, of course, there's the status shift. Um, you know, when we get older, we, we lose our status. We become retired. 
uh, we don't have the same social status. And that's especially true, and that's where the suicide rate among older people is the highest, among older white males. And again, I'm not saying suggest one theory. I always tell my students, you know, when, whenever you're dealing with theories or models, uh, the, the basic, basic principle is, um, you know, they're meaningful if they work for you, if they help you understand your client, or they help your client understand their issues. So that's the use of models. Okay. Um, I don't know how this got shifted around, so I, I, I have to apologize for that. But one of the things that's interesting about going back to grief and addiction is what I call clashing paradigms. Um, that, you know, that when you're working in grief, we tell people to confront their emotions, confront, confront their other reactions to grief. And substance abuse therapy often is, uh, suggests taking emotional control and not using pain as, a, as emotion for use. So you can see that sometimes the paradigms of this clash, and my apology for that. So going on to another issue, what is trauma-informed care? And trauma-informed care is just being written about now, and it encompasses a sensitivity to respecting patients so they're not re-traumatized in therapy. Six basic principles. We want to make people feel safe. We want to be transparent and, and trustworthy. We want to help them to assist to find peer support. We want to create a context of collaboration and mutuality. We want to empower choice. And again, we want to be sensitive to cultural, historical, and gender issues that might make one group less, uh, less trustful than another. So we want to be aware of all that in trauma. We don't want to re-traumatize people in therapy. When, and I really want to stress that, that issue of, of empowerment because um, one of my favorite colleagues uh, died in, in, in about 23 years ago was a woman by the name of Catherine Sanders. She was really one of the pioneers in the field. And Catherine was a very interesting person as a person. Now here's a question that I'm, I'm sure very few hands are going to raise for, okay? How many of you remember the television series, I Led Three Lives? Okay. Two of us. Okay. But I'm glad you're there for me. Okay. Um, I Led Three Lives was a was a television show from the 1950s, really during the McCarthy era. I was just a little boy then. I'm sure you were just a little girl then. But it was, a, it was one of the more popular shows. And I Led Three Lives was about a guy who was an American businessman. That was his open public life. But he was also a member of the nefarious Communist Party. But unbeknownst to the Communist Party, he was an FBI agent. He's a double agent. So every week, the, the task was he had to foil some dangerous communist plot against the United States. Remember, remember the time, the early 50s. While at the tame, same time preserving his own identity as an agent. Well, Catherine Sanders actually did lead three lives. Not in that way. But her first life was as a high fashion model. And even to the end of her life, she was a beautiful woman. You could see that even in her 80s. She had that class. She dated Howard Hughes at one point in time. That's probably something that you're going to have to explain to your students, those of you who teach here. Uh, but Howard Hughes, uh, she dated Howard Hughes. She had all these wonderful experiences. She was a very well-received high. And then she ended up marrying Herschel Sanders, a dashing Coast Guard commander. And she became a military wife. And one day in Pensacola, Florida, as she stood and watched her 15-year-old son, Jimmy, um, water ski, a boat, into, a boat came between him and his tow rope, tow line, and he slammed into the boat and died instantly as she watched on shore. And Catherine Sanders then decided that she wanted to go to college and she wanted to study grief. And in the late 1950s, that took you about an afternoon because there's almost nothing written in those days. And so she became one of the leading and early grief researchers. But one of the things she stressed is she said, stressed that, based on empirical studies, she stressed that people go through a series of different phases. 
as they, they experience bereavement. And again, it was, you know, it's a workable model. Um, but again, remember what we said about models. And she said the first one is the, the awareness of loss. And she developed an instrument called the Sanders Grief Experience Inventory, which we still use in the field today. And that tried to measure the intensity of grief. And so Sanders said, okay, this is a time of high pain. And then they go through a period of what she called conservation and withdrawal. She said, in this period, people are, um, they look like they're, they're returning. They're, they're, you know, they're going back to work, they're going back to school. Uh, but it's taking all their energy to do that. And basically, they have nothing left. So they get through the day, and then they get home, and they just collapse. There's, you know, there's no, um, no social life, no, not, nothing else but just dealing with, with what they have to deal with, and then the grief. And she said, in that stage, this is interesting. Remember, this is in the, in, in the early 1960s, uh, late 1960s, I should say. Catherine says, people have choices. It's interesting. Grief and choices. And she says, and one of those choices is that some people will sicken and die. They won't take care of themselves. Um, and consciously or unconsciously, they'll, they'll seek death. Said another choice is they'll, they'll, they'll continue the status quo. They'll just live their life that way. I had a client who represented that to me. Um, she had a very close relationship with her sister. They were two adult women, they lived together, they had spent their whole lives together. Um, and she said, when my sister was alive, she told me, it was like watching a, color, uh, a, a colorized comedy show. She said, we had a great time together. We were always laughing, we were always enjoying ourselves, we were always doing these great things. And she said, when she died, it was like the plug was pulled and the TV was blank. And she said, what I've gotten from you is that the TV's on now, but it's still black and white. And, and, and she said, I said, we can get the color back. She said something very interesting to me that I never forgot. She said, to do so would be a betrayal of my sister. In other words, she decided to live life in that conservation withdrawal. You know, I, I can get through it now. That's good, you gave me something. But if I enjoy life again, it's like saying I had no relationship with my sister, that my sister wasn't that important. I found that sad, but I had to respect her choice. And then other people will make a choice to say, no, this is not how I want to live. One of my favorite examples of that in her book is a woman who had a, 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 whose daughter lived close to her and saw her daughter every day, her adult daughter. And her adult daughter had a, uh, had a six-year-old child who she adored, the, this older woman who adored her granddaughter. But, um, and every time she saw her, she would cry because her husband had died seven years ago and he never got a chance to see his wonderful granddaughter. And one day, as they were walking out, she heard the little girl say to her mother, she said, is that all grandma does, mom? She just cries all the time. And she said, I needed to change. She said, I didn't want to be remembered as the grandma who always cried. And so that was her source, that was her choice to say, no, this is not the life I want. I want the color back. Powerful testimony. I want the color back. So, um, one of the things I always took out of that uh, is that whenever I counsel, for those of you who are counseling grief, one of the, one of the lessons I take of that is that I always pose questions as choices. So I won't say now with clients, how are you gonna handle the holidays? I will say, how do you choose to handle the holidays? You know, I, I wanna give them autonomy back because one day they're gonna have to make a much bigger choice. The much bigger choice is there, are they gonna find a new life that's meaningful in the face of loss or just continue as grieving people? for the rest of their lives. That doesn't mean we won't find surges of grief throughout life, we do. We'll see that in a minute. So again, you know, those are important. So let's just review quickly. Grief is a reaction to loss. It affects us many ways, physically, emotionally, cognitively, spiritually, behaviorally. It's an individual, I like to use the example roller coaster. It's a roller coaster. But I, 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 and I like giving metaphors when I counsel. 
but you have to be careful with metaphors. So I'd always say to you, if you came on, into my office and we were talking about grief, I'd say, did you ever ride a roller coaster? And if you said to me, yeah, when I was younger, I used to ride them all the time. I used to love roller coasters. I'd say, well, you're kind of on one now. Maybe not as pleasant a one, but you're going to have ups and downs. You're going to have highs and lows. You're going to have times when the grief is intense and times when it's not so intense. But the one thing I want to be cautious of, of someone who says to me, no, I was always terrified of roller coasters. Then it's no longer a therapeutic metaphor when you say, well, grief is kind of a roller coaster. Uh, because that brings up the terror. And again, it's not a time-bound process. We never lose, our we never lose the relationship. We, um, we keep connections to the deceased. We keep a continuing bond. I don't even like to use the term as recovery or resolution. I like to say that over time, pain diminishes. Individuals function as well as they did. And what we're learning now is that some people experience growth as they grieve. Some people do better after a loss because they've learned new skills, they've learned new insights, they've learned new things about themselves. But grief has a developmental effect that you live with that loss. You don't get over it, you don't recover from it, you live with it. And there may be a time when an eight-year-old girl, for example, loses her father, and 15 years later she's walking down the aisle with her stepfather, with her uncle, with her mother, with her brother, and at that moment, even in the midst of this profound happiness, she feels an undercurrent of grief. That's typical grief. But I want to spend a few moments, and I want to leave a little time for questions, about what we call more complicated grief. And estimates show that between, and many of the cases that we've talked about, homicide, uh, suicide, are more likely to create these complications of grief. Estimates show that about between a fifth and a third of people are at risk for such a reaction, and maybe a tenth to a fifth actually experience it. So what is it? Well, Rando describes it as this, a generic term indicating that given the amount of time since the death, there is some compromise, distortion, or failure of one or more of the processes of mourning. Strobe and Schutt say it's a clinically significant deviation from the culture uh, norm, so they bring in culture here, either in the time and intensity of symptoms or the level of impairment. So some people have something that's beyond normal grief. Shear talks about, uh, Catherine Shear, I'm going to talk about in a minute, talks about what she calls acute grief, which can then become integrated into our lives or become complicated, which later therapy may allow us to reintegrate into our lives again. So what are the symptoms of complicated mourning over time? Well, you can't speak of the loss without intense grief. A minor event triggers grief. Themes of loss constantly reoccur. Here's an interesting one, and this is one you have to be careful about. Develop symptoms or behaviors of the deceased. This is what I call um, a yellow light rather than a red light. And what this means is that, you know, sometimes it just may be a normal adjustment to loss. It may be that dad was the disciplinarian, mom was the, uh, the, the, the soft-spoken reconciler, and now when dad dies, mom has to get more strict or the kids are going to run all over her. But in other cases, it may be an inability to let go of that person, so you want to incorporate some of that person into yourself. Uh, Refusal to change environment, you know, people don't move the deceased property, and again, you always have to check on that one too. Sometimes they may have a good reason for not changing the property, you know, moving things around. Uh, you know, I had one older man who said, I still have my wife's stuff in my drawers, my bedroom drawers, just because it would upset me more not to have it than to have it. That's fine. And then I have my extreme case. This was an interesting case. Um, this was a case that, was, that I came to me from, a, was a referral from a student of mine who was now a grief counselor. And what had happened is she was, in, she was, inter, she was counseling a woman who had til, two children die of a genetic disease. Her third child um, was born when genetic testing was available and he did not have that, that, that disease. Uh, she had before him a boy and a girl. The girl, this boy knew, 
Um, he died about, you know, he was, she was about 14, he was about six when she died, uh, when his sister died. The other boy he did not know. Um, let's call the boy, the, the boy who died Tom. And, um, and Tom um, was in his brother's room, you know, and, and that's how it was referred to. Tom was, uh, what did we say the first kid's name was? I don't know. Joe and Jim, okay. That's what happens when you make up names. They're a lot easier, a lot harder to remember. Not cases, but names. So, you know, so Joey was living in Jimmy's room. And that's how it was described to him. This is, you know, your brother's room. Hadn't been changed since Jimmy died. Um, and, and it was causing conflict. And what, what happened is when, when the younger boy, Jimmy, was eight, eight years old or whatever we called him, uh, he, uh, he punched his mother. And the mother was already in counseling, and, um, and, and my student said, would you counsel the boy? Would you counsel the kid? And I said, yeah, but I'll only counsel him under one thing when she described the situation, and that's that he gets control over his room. That he can decorate it, that they move out Jimmy, you know, all the stuff that was Jimmy's, and, and he has control of his room. A little eight-year-old walks into my office, not happy at being there. And I said, you know, do you know why you're here? Uh, do you know what I'm going to ask you? And he looked at me somewhat defiantly. He said, you're going to ask me why I hit my mother. And I said, no, I'm wondering why it took you eight years. And at that point, the kid laughed. He came over and hugged me, and he said, you're the guy who got me my room. We had great therapy after that. One of my best experiences in therapy. But I, I love that response to him. Uh, history of depression, anxiety can trigger it again. Self-destructive or other destructive, or of course the biggest one is grief is disabling in key life areas. And again, when mourning becomes complicated, it not only affects mental health, it affects physical health, morbidity, and mortality. So what has research found to be factors in complicated grief? Uh, again, Bonanno's research found excessively dependent relationships. Scott and White found three major things and two other things, the Scott and White study. Younger age, obviously, traumatic death, what we had talked about, the perception of preventability, and of course, a history of mental illness and a history of a number of other losses. Another set by Lobb, uh, Prior to the loss, previous losses, exposure to trauma, psychiatric history, attachment style, prior relationships, and associated with the loss, again, complicated deaths, complicated loss. Violent deaths, uh, bad caregiving experiences, uh, dependent relationships, little preparation for the loss, and lack of social support. Uh, and again, what studies have shown is that after about four months, if people are not doing well, that's a danger sign. So how can we classify complicated mourning? Um, you have all night? Um, well, I like Warden. Warden says there are you know, different syndromes. He called chronic syndrome. You just keep grieving and grieving and grieving. We'll talk about that again. Exaggerated grief where instead of anger, for example, you have rage. Instead of guilt, which are normal, you have excessive guilt. Mass grief, another problem like addiction presents itself, or delayed grief. You know who gets delayed grief? You know who gets delayed grief? Look to your left, look to your right, look in a mirror. It's often caregivers. It's often professionals because you become so focused on helping others that you never really deal with your own sense of loss and your own sense of grief. So it comes up in weird instances. One of my favorite examples of that was I had a clergyman come to me, Episcopalian clergyman, who said, I don't understand what's wrong. He said, I buried my brother, I buried my mother, I buried one of my best friends, and, and, and I was great. I did their funerals, I, I did everything, I was there for the family. My dog died, and I've been weeping every day. And I said, you know what the problem with the dog was? And he looked at me. He said, he didn't have puppies. He looked at me. 
I said, there was nobody else you could focus your care on. This was your loss and your loss alone. Sometimes that happens. Um, also, one of my concepts that I contributed to the field is disenfranchised grief. And disenfranchised grief is also a factor in complicated grief. Uh, that's a loss that cannot be openly uh, acknowledged, socially sanctioned, or publicly mourned. It's one thing to lose a spouse, right? It's another thing to lose your lover in an extramarital affair. How do you explain that one? So, well, how do we classify complicated grief in, in, in the DSM-5? You all know the DSM? Everybody knows the DSM? Okay. Well, we're now to the DSM-5-TR. And this is something that somebody has to explain to me. When the, okay, when the DSM-5 came out, they switched from Roman numerals to Arabic numerals, and they made a good argument for that. They said this way, when we have new versions, we can have 5.1, 5.2, and now they came out with a new version. It's um, DSM-5-TR. I don't know why they did that. Seems to me it should be DSM-5-1. Anyway, 5.1, I mean. Oh, by the way, there is no DSM-1. The first volume came out just as the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. They thought they knew everything about mental disease in that time. So they never labeled it one. Um, first published in 1952, uh, the three uh, introduced the bereavement exclusion, which was that you could not be diagnosed with depression if you had recently had a loss. Uh, and really what's interesting about DSM-5, uh, TR, is that's the first time they did a bunch of things, but this is the first time they actually recognize grief can be complicated. So, for example, um, you know, there have been studies, we'll, we'll talk about that later, um, uh, about complicated grief treatment, but let me, let me talk about what it is. So, complicated grief in the DSM 5 TR. Well, we always recognize that post traumatic stress disorder can have, uh, you know, can, an antecedent to that could be a significant loss. Uh, we now um, can diagnose depression. And that always, and, and I was an outlier in my professional association, the Association for Death Education and Counseling, because when, when the argument came about eliminating the bereavement exclusion, there were a lot of people who were very fearful of it, think, thought it might lead to overmedication and overdiagnosis. I thought it was silly to have a bereavement exclusion for, for, for grief. You could, you could lose a cat, but you, you know, and, and be depressed. But you couldn't, you, you know, you, you lose your wife and you're not? Never made much sense to me. Um, adjustment disorder can have, a, can have a bereavement sub, you know, subcategory. Separation anxiety, which was changed now to allow, um, refers to the fear of losing other attachment figures. And what became a really significant one is that they created a, a, a condition called prolonged grief disorder. And I'm going to make the argument in a minute, I'll make it now. That, um, that this is going to be the beginning of a series of, of, of categories um, because there's a disconnect between what grief theorists say are complications to grief and what the DSM-5 says are complications to grief. But at least something that looks like chronic grief is now recognized as prolonged grief disorder. And again, um, there's some really interesting approaches by Catherine Shear and her associates. I won't go through them. But you can see it. Do, do they have access to these slides? OK. So if you email Lauren, she can make them available to you. So you can read this on your own. But this is a, a new and exciting treatment um, that really seems to be working out relatively well. But I want to close with one point and leave a few minutes for questions. And last but not least, dear Lord, take care of yourself if you don't we're all in trouble. Ask caregivers. We have to take care of ourselves. How many of you have, are caregivers, active caregivers? How many of you felt like this buffalo? I am just so tense, I think I'll go down to the ranger station and get shot with a tranquilizer dart. <laughs> I once showed this in pre-Katrina New Orleans to 500 critical care nurses. 
in a darkened auditorium, and I put on this slide without comment, and there was a voice from the audience that said, where the hell is the ranger station? <laughs> Somebody else suggested the hotel bar. Well, you have to practice good self-care. If you're going to be in this field, you have to practice good self-care. Part of that is individual. You have to validate your sense of loss. You know, there's a new book on countertransference by Renee Katz, and I can't think of the other author right on, on, off, off the, uh, of the hand. But one of the things Renee Katz says is that, you know, saying you don't want to be engaged in countertransference is saying you, you don't want to breathe. It's an inevitable part of a relationship. How many of you found you like certain clients? How many of you found you didn't? <laughs> okay. Yeah, there are times I'd look at my book and say, oh, I'm seeing this person next. <laughs> and there are other times I looked at my book and say, oh, she's fun. And she's challenging, you know, or whatever it is. You know, you're going to have feelings towards your clients. Don't pretend that you're not. Don't pretend that the losses don't affect you. They do. You have to validate your own grief. You need respite and stress management. You have to find your own ways of doing that. You know what one of my stress management techniques is? I never watch movies about grief and loss. Everyone says, you love this movie. It's about a kid who's dying of AIDS. No, thank you. You know? I don't want to see any, I, that's what I deal with or at least during that time I dealt with it, I don't want to deal with this in a movie. When's the nearest next South Park movie coming out or something? <laughs> and then a philosophy, which was writ both large and small. And what I mean by small is, you know, what's the role? Uh, what, what is our vision of our role? We're not going to make everybody feel better all the time. Hopefully we'll have a good record at that. And then what's our larger philosophy? If you're involved in the field, you have to come in touch with your spirituality, however you define it. You're going to see unfair things happen to people all the time. Nice people are going to get dealt a really terrible hand. How do you deal with that? But, and this is a big but, your organization should be supportive. Individual self-care is not just an individual problem. It's how can your organization support. And it does that by providing education. Hopefully if you're, um, hopefully if you're being sent here by an organization or your, your organization, hopefully you're getting co compensatory time for that. If not, go back to them and say, I said you should be. Okay? Um, do they provide support, both informally and, and, uh, and, and formally? You know, formal support is, do they have, I work for um, a child care agency in the midst of the AIDS crisis that placed, foster, that placed uh, HIV positive kids in foster care. The rule of thumb, I was a consultant to them, the rule of thumb in the early days of the, of the pandemic, the AIDS pandemic, was that a third of these kids died within the first uh, six months, a third died within the first year, and by three, every kid was dead. That was just the reality of it, again, early on in the pandemic. And, um, and of course, when a child dies in forced to care in New York City, you can imagine the mountains of paperwork that have to be done. Because the agency wants to say, we had nothing to do with this death. Now, you might say, they, well, didn't they modify it because you were dealing with kids who had a terminal diagnosis? And the answer was no. This is New York City bureaucracy. So um, what was interesting about this is that the agency that I worked with was very, what we called, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the, oh, Anderson. Uh, a guy by the name of Anderson did a, did a study on, on two agencies, chose our agency, which he called support conscious. We provided rituals for the family, for the social workers and nurses, because you'd have a social work nursing team working very closely with this kid. So. We, you know, we would, so they, we had rituals, and, and we encouraged them to go to the funeral. We gave them compensatory time, but they were working at the funeral. We recognized that. So we had a ritual for them whenever a child, one of their children died, in-house. We also had a support group that meant, and, th and this was an interesting support group, it meant, it meant uh, bi-weekly, okay? About a third of the people came all the time. 
about a third of the staff came when they were in crisis, personal crisis. And a third of the staff never came. And then we, after the year, we did an evaluation. And we said, was the support group somewhat useful, somewhat useful, not useful? What do you think we found? A third, a third, a third? We found 100% virtually saying very useful. So yeah, so I had the same reaction. When we went back to those people, we said, well, if it's so useful, why don't you come? They told us something very interesting. They said, not my thing, but the fact that the organization had it gave me a message that my grief was recognized, that my grief was acknowledged, that it wasn't disenfranchised. I always love when they throw my own work back at me. Um, okay, so here's the question. Anderson said, which organization has higher morale? Support-centered, or the other organization, by the way, was focused on getting all the reports done as quickly as possible that needed to be given to the city. Which organization do you think had higher, uh, higher morale? Ours, support-centered, or the bureaucratic? Come on, I'm not doing this alone, folks. Support, right? Which organization do you think had higher compliance? Support one. Because it's not, really. When people are supported in the work, when you create an informal support system where people say, here, I can do some of this report for you, things are going to get done more quickly than when you're just ignored. And, of course, ritual. And as I said, while we encouraged staff to attend the funerals and gave them time more for doing so, we also created our own in-house ritual for every child who died. So we're going to have about 10 minutes, a little less than 10 minutes for questions and answers because I want to get you out on time. But I want to leave you with the final words of Frank and Ernest. Good work for you therapists. My therapist says you're my, own be my, therapist says you're my own best friend, but I refuse to lower my standards that much. <laughs> be your own best friend. You can't take care of others unless you take care of yourself. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Yes. Oh, is there any support for people who are deaf and, and hard of hearing? And the answer is not as much as there should be, which I think you probably knew. Um, no, uh, and, and there are a lot of marginalized groups, and, and unfortunately that's, that's one of them. Um, that, um, um, so no, we need, we need more services for those who are hearing impaired, very definitely. I don't know of any in this region, do you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Doesn't surprise me, unfortunately. And if anybody else knows, would you raise your hand? Just, yeah, you. If anybody, you see her, you see her over here, if anybody knows of some closer services, uh, please get that information to her. Oh, good. And where do you offer it? Wonderful. You see, yeah, see her in, afterwards? And where are you? Okay, great. I think we solved a problem. Thank you. But you'd agree with the statement that we, we really need more, more training and more support, right? Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I really want to... Oh, yes, one more question. So the question is, does the age of, of somebody make, the age when they experience their first loss? And um, the answer to that would be likely. Um, let me give you an example. John Balby, who's really 
in many ways, the grandfather, you know, many of you know Balbi's work on attachment and separation and loss. Those were his three big volumes. Uh, John Balbi was, uh, and John Balbi has an interesting history. One of his students was Colin Murray Parks, who's really the father of bereavement studies uh, in, in, in England and, and in the United States. Still alive in his 90s. But um, John Balbi once uh, theorized that when children have a loss very early in their life, it, it creates a lifelong impairment in attachment. Mostly he talked about the maternal loss. And, and basically that these kids will have a hard problem in, in dealing with, with loss throughout life. Now the research hasn't really supported that because it's, it's point, pointed out, number one, that he was really based on um, maternal loss. And, and the issue becomes really, uh, so it's not as, as innately damning as Bob, Bobby thought. The, the critical question becomes two things when a child experiences an early loss. Um, one is um, how much support are other people? Are there other people around that child to, you know, uh, to provide a, a, an, an enclosure of attachment, for lack of a better word? That's actually a good word. Uh, uh, you know, and then the second thing is many times these losses are related to the birth. You know, that maybe somebody got sick in, in, in the terms of, you know, uh, the, the, um, you know the, the, the birth process didn't go well or something like that. And if that's the case, how is this loss explained to the child? And I have two cases who exemplify this perfectly. In one was a, a kid, I, uh, a young man I, I, who came to me in college when I was still at Concordia, who, who was always, uh, his mother died as a result of, his mother had breast cancer and she wanted to have the child and, and therefore chose not, not to take chemotherapy until the child was born and not to, uh, not to have radiation and not to abort, uh, which was an option. And, uh, and the father made it clear that he looked at his son as, you know, the cause of that death. Um, if it wasn't for you, mom would be alive today. And, and so obviously that had a, uh, you can imagine, an extremely complicated and negative effect. The other kid was a kid whose mother died of MS. And MS has a strange relationship to pregnancy. In some cases, it actually can stabilize uh, about 10%. Um, in about uh, another 40% of cases, it can actually degenerate. Uh, and then the other cases doesn't seem to have any effect. A and when this kid was explained to it by his father, he said, um, he said, mommy, mommy and I chose to have you because that was the one thing she wanted to have was a child. And if she would have gotten an abortion, a medical abortion, which she could have gotten, she would have never been happy. Um, but you were the joy of her life. And even though her life was only two years, you and, and you know, and the guy would say, it makes me, te it makes me tearful when I even just speak about what he said. Um, you are the living legacy to your mom. Obviously, that's a very different way of explaining it to a child. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Ah. Oh, I would agree with you entirely. Yeah. The same parent. Yeah. Um, yes. Oh, it's a terrible thing. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, I was on the board of McAllister for a while. Um, and, and I would certainly underline that and agree with that. And I always like what Bowman says, uh, family therapist, every sibling grows up in a different home. You know? So, you want to hear a terrible story from my childhood? Okay. When we were growing up, my, my brother was considerably older than the rest of the family. And, um, and you know, and his relationship with my parents was, at least until he got older, more troubled. You know, dropped out of the high school at 16, joined the Navy, things like that, you know. 
And I always remember, my sister always reminds me that when I was four and she was 12, we found, uh, we found a kitten. And my mother, uh, my sister and I were talking about we wanted to keep the kitten. We did keep the kitten. But my, mother, my sister had good advice. She said, if mommy comes home first, you ask mommy. If daddy comes home first, I'll ask daddy. And I said, you know, I agreed. And I looked at her and I said, you know, we really don't need Frankie. That was my older brother. So we still joke about that today. Um, but you're right, every, every sibling grows up in a different home. Or not the same father. It's, it's the dynamic of the family changes with each child. Any other? Well, remember, I'll be outside and I will look forward to, oh, we have a hand up? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, prolonged grief, to, to summarize it, you know, because it has, as any DSM category does, has a lot of different criteria. But to boil it down to its essential, it's that past a year or six months for children and adolescents, uh, so six months for children and adolescents, a year for adults, um, that there's still significant impairment in the person's ability to function in key social roles. So it, 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 it sort of you know, says you can't diagnose it with children until after six months and with adults until after a year. So it, it, it's the severity of symptoms um, influencing functioning, but, um, but you know, past a period of time. Okay, and also, you know, any of the DSM, one of the nice things about DSM-5 TR is it always has that statement, you know, uh, you always have to take it into account what the cultural norms of that society are. So, that answer? Thank you. Dr. Doka, thank you. <clears throat> I think now you can all see why we are so honored to have Dr. Ken Doka join us. This is the second part of a three-part series. So we will be back in 2024 with Dr. Doka as our guest speaker. And we will announce the dates and keep everyone informed. And thank you for joining us. Again, our thanks and gratitude to the Kaplan Family Foundation and to Father Greg um, for his continual support and presence. And Father, at the request of Joan Kaplan, we ask that you join us in a closing prayer and bless it. Lord our God, we ask your presence this evening and we do recognize that we, are, we find ourselves in the season of miracles as we discuss these very difficult topics, this idea of complex grief. We also recognize the need for us to be instruments of healing. And we ask you to allow us to be instruments of healing and we ask you to allow us to assist, to be assisted in healing ourselves. We ask you to be present and to keep us always in your love. And it is with gratitude that we listen to this lecture and we thank you for the gift of this evening. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Yeah, very good. And now we ask you to join us outside for coffee, desserts, and there's, awful, there's also dessert bags to take home with you as well. So thank you again. <laughs>